Bibles to Mark chapter 11, and um, we're going to get started. Last week we talked about hearing uh, the Holy Spirit and hearing the voice of God speak to us in our inner man and listening to the Holy Spirit. And we asked God this question before we left last week, and the question was, do you love me? And we got quiet before the Lord, and we heard the Lord speak to us. The Lord always speaks to us in line with his word. He never says anything outside of his word, the counsel of his word. The Spirit will always speak and glorify Jesus. And to glorify Jesus is to say and do and be like him. And so the Spirit will always lead us to do what Jesus would do. And he always says things that are in line with this. Now, we're going to talk about a little bit more about the Holy Spirit today. And, I, and there's something that I read in Mark chapter 11 that caught my eye a couple weeks ago. And it is a, a story that probably many of you have heard. And we're going to look at, before we discover the certain different ways that we can hear the voice of God and how God leads us. You know, sometimes God won't say anything, but he'll give you a leading, a nudge. How many of you have ever experienced that leading or that nudge? I have. You know, you should do this. You know, it's just kind of like a, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of those things where growing up, my dad or my mom would look at me and they wouldn't have to say a word. They would look at me and I would know exactly what I was supposed to do. How many of you ever been there? <laughs> right. You know, you're doing something and your dad looks at you and you're like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Right? Well, there's a leading and a nudge that comes from the Holy Spirit. But before we go into all that, I want to show you how important it is to have the Holy Spirit in your life and to function in your life with the Holy Spirit constantly there and the power of the Holy Spirit. How important that is. Many of you have heard the story of one of the, the disciples is Peter. And we're going to look at this story again about Peter. And I'm going to show you how important it is to have the Holy Spirit, to sing in the morning with the Holy Spirit, to ask the Holy Spirit questions, to listen to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the Word. It magnifies the Word, and it gives us power to live the Christian life. Okay, It gives us power to live the Christian life. And I want to take a look at this. Mark chapter 11, verse 50. This is probably one of the darkest moments of human history, and this is the night that Jesus was betrayed. I'm pretty sure this is probably one of the darkest moments in human history, the night that Jesus was betrayed. Mark chapter 11, verse 50. And I'm going to go through this, and I want to show you a man with great intentions, but does not have the Holy Spirit power. Great intentions. Watch this. Mark chapter 11, verse 50. It says this, And they all left him and fled. So Jesus is betrayed. They take him, and all the disciples split. Verse 51. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away <laughs> Naked. Now, um, Mark chapter 11, verse 50. What happens is, is that all the disciples split. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 14, verse 50. Okay, I'm sorry. Good, good, good job. I don't know why. Mark 14, verse 50. There you go, there you go. See? What happens when you listen to the Holy Spirit, not man? You get on the right page. There you go. Very good, David. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, Mark chapter 14, verse 50. I was just testing y'all to see if y'all knew what y'all were doing. <laughs> just making sure y'all know what y'all are doing. Okay. All right. Okay. So, Mark chapter 14, verse 50. So, what happens is all the disciples flee. One of them follows very closely, and the guards grab him, and he somehow gets out of his clothes and runs away stark naked, just books it, okay? Now, that was a great effort to try to keep up with Jesus. That's a noble thing. 
He's trying to go with Jesus and maybe do something and get him free. But guess what? Even that trying leads with him running away with nothing on. Okay? Powerless, clothesless, he's in trouble. He's running away naked. Now watch what happens. And they led Jesus to the high priest, verse 53, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Now watch this, verse 54. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, right up into the courtyard of the high priest. Watch this. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now, Peter, I get Peter. I get him. I get what kind of disciple he is. He's a guy that loves Jesus. He's a guy that wants to do what's best. He's a guy that, that is just wants to do good. He's a guy that wants to follow Jesus. He even told Jesus, look, we're going to die with you tonight. I'm going to stick by you tonight. All the best intentions of the world right there. I, Jesus, we're going to stick with you. I love you. I'm your man. I'm with you, Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, you're going to deny me before the end of the night. And he's like, no, I'm going to stick with you. How many of you ever met a Christian or you've been that person who has the best intentions in the world and you love Jesus? Huh. I've been there. I've been there. The best disciple Jesus has doesn't even follow him close by. He's at a distance. Now I want you to watch the position of Peter. Best intentions in the whole world. Now watch what happens when he follows Jesus. He begins at a distance. He begins at a distance. And what caught my eye when I was reading this was this. G uh, Peter was warming himself by the fire. Here is his rabbi, the, the guy that he looks up to, the guy that he's following in a, in a council where he is being... Um, interrogated in a cold, dark place, but yet Peter, from a distance, decides to warm himself by a fire. Do you see how far best intentions get in the Christian life? See, self-preservation will always hinder you from following Jesus to the fullest. I'm going to say that again. Self-preservation will always hinder you from following Jesus to the fullest. What will people think of me? What will people say? What about this? What about this? Well, I have to self-preserve, but guess what? Jesus calls us to self-sacrifice. But even the best intentions cannot self-sacrifice. Our best intentions, our best intentions, we love Jesus, we want to follow him, and we just want to do what's right, but yet we are cloaked with this one thing, self-preservation, always. What about me? What about warming myself? So Peter... Now, all the disciples are gone. This is Jesus' best disciple right here. And he is at a distance and preserving himself. Now, watch who he's sitting with because that plays into the story of best intentions. He's sitting with the guards right there in the courtyard from a distance. And look what happens. Let's keep reading. Verse 55. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments what further witness do we need? We have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all 
condemned him as deserving, deserving death. Now stop right there. Peter at a distance, warming himself by the fire. Jesus in a cold place, being integrated. And Peter does not speak up one word. Peter gives no defense for the man who at least saved him from drowning one time. Okay, y'all know the story. Come walk on the water with me. And Peter starts to sink. And Jesus saves him from drowning. At least. At least. Not only that, here is Peter, a man who saw Jesus do miracles. A man who saw Jesus walk on water. A man who was a part of his ministry. A man who not only saw Jesus do miracles, but somebody who was participating in the miracles with Jesus when he fed the 5,000. Here's a man who lived three and a half years with the Savior of the world, and here he's being interrogated, and Peter keeps his mouth shut. What a coward. Right? Best intentions. But he doesn't say anything. No protest. Couldn't have said, but hold on, I saw him walk on water. Hey, I saw him do this. You saw him feed the 5,000. What wrong was there? He, nothing, nothing. He's at a distance. He's worried about how cold his hands and feet are, and he's seeing this going on, and there's nothing that he says. There's nothing that he does. Nothing. He's, he's powerless. There's no defense. He starts out at a distance from Jesus, and now there is no defense for Jesus. Now watch this. Verse 65 and some began to spit on him and cover his face to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. Now watch this. And the guards received him with blows. Now who was sitting with the guards? Who was sitting with the guards? Answer. Peter. Best intentions. So I'm at a distance from Jesus. I have no defense for Jesus. Not only that, but when it comes down to it, I'm sitting with the guards. They get up, and here comes Jesus, and they just start to pummel him. Now, let me just ask you this. If you love somebody dearly, and you are willing to go to bat for them and even to die for them, do you think that when that started to happen, that you would at least go in and get in the mix of the fight? Would you? I mean, I'll, I'll ask you like this, Garrett. You love your wife, yes. If somebody went to your wife and just hit her, I mean just pummeled her, just boom, what would you do? Huh? Pummel them. Yeah. You wouldn't be like, hey, let's pray, brother. No. It's on. Now, say it's several people, and you think, well, if I get in this mix, I might die myself. You still would, wouldn't you? Because you love her. And I bet you anything, if you're any kind of good husband, if somebody hits your wife, it's going to trigger something in your mind. If you're if a good, good man, it will trigger something, and you are going to see red, and you are going to hurt, maim, and even kill somebody. Yeah, you laugh. You laugh. All right? I'd try. I'd be like a chihuahua. You know? Not like a pit bull. <laughs> Go crazy. Right? Here is Peter and a man he loves. He spent three and a half years, and this man saved him from drowning. This man did all kinds of stuff. And the guards get up and start to just beat him, and he stands there, does nothing. He's sitting with the guards. <laughs> But Peter, don't you have the best intentions? Yes, but Peter, do you have the power? No, you don't. It's amazing how in the Christian life, best intentions get you only so far. Isn't it? It's funny. Let's keep reading. I'm going to show you something. He's sitting with the guards, and Peter does nothing. Let's keep reading. Now, he started off at a distance, then there's no defense. For Jesus, He started out behind Jesus at a distance, behind him. Now watch this. And as Peter was below, below, below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warn himself, she looked at him, warming himself, she looked at him. Also, aren't you also with the Nazarene Jesus? 
But he denied it, saying, I neither know or understand what you mean. And he went out in the gateway, and the rooster crowed. So he starts off behind Jesus at a distance. Best intentions, best intentions. I'm with you, Jesus, to the very end. Trust me, I'm going to be with you. Behind Jesus at a distance, now he's below in the courtyard. He doesn't defend Jesus from the guards. And a little bitty servant girl comes up to him and scares him to death. Because she looks at him and she sees right through who he is and says, Aren't you one of the Nazarenes? Don't you follow Jesus? And Peter, being the best intentioned Christian that you could possibly be, looks at this little girl and says, no, I don't know him. Self-preservation will hinder you from following Jesus fully. He says, I don't know him. I neither know nor understand what you mean. He acts like no habla, no blind glass. He's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, you're speaking a different language. And the servant girl saw him and began to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. They could tell by his accent. Galilean had an accent. That's kind of like if Jesus was born in Texas, and Jesus had a Texan accent, and then we were there when they were trying to get a hold of him, like, wait a minute, you know Jesus, you're from Texas. And you're like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Really? No, seriously. I'm going to get on my horse right out here. It's over there on the right-hand side of the car. You know, I'm like, really? You're from Texas. So they look at him, and they're like, you're from Galilean. We can tell by your accent. We, you, you know. And Peter, this is what Peter does. He says this, certainly you're one of them before you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. He starts cussing. I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Now watch this. And he broke down and he wept. Peter goes from being at a distance from Jesus to not defending Jesus to denying Jesus. Peter goes from being behind Jesus to being below Jesus to now being a man who is broken. Best intentions without the Holy Spirit lead to a denying of who Jesus is in your life. Now, some of the, that's, that's pretty heavy because I've got all the best intentions of the world. I do. I've got all the best intentions. And God knows I've got good intentions. God knows I try. But you know what the secret to all of this whole thing is? It's, it occurs in Acts. Because here you have a man with best intentions that the best he can do is follow behind Jesus, and the best he can do is get below, and the best he can do is become a broken man. The best you can do, the best disciple that, 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 that Jesus has after three and a half years is somebody who follows at a distance, somebody who warms himself, somebody who doesn't defend Jesus, and somebody who actually denies Jesus, not once, not twice, but three, three times. Three times, and he breaks down and he weeps. That weeping right there is not like just moisture around the eyes. That is an uncontrollable weeping. It is the weeping that Jesus says that when they be cast into outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Peter is in a moment where he rejects Christ, and now he is regretful and remorseful and doesn't know what to do. At this point in time, Peter looks very similar to Judas. Very similar. But he's got good intentions, guys. He's got good intentions. He at least followed him. Yeah, Judas followed. Judas made some cash off of it, too. And you know that Judas, at this point in time, becomes very remorseful and regretful. But here's the two things, the things that separate Judas from Peter right here. Judas ends up committing suicide. Peter breaks down and weeps, and guess what happens? His best intentions come to nothing. They look very similar. Christians, I know this in my life, Christians with the best intentions without the power of the Holy Spirit look very similar to unbelievers. 
They do. They do. I know my own Christian, before I received the Holy Spirit and got power to do something, I looked and behaved much like my friends who didn't know Jesus. Now, I was saved. My heart would ache. I would be remorseful, regretful. But it was like, what do you do? How do you overcome? How do you, how do, you do this kind of stuff? How do you live the Christian life, a life of holiness? See, you can't get to holiness with best intentions. You know what I mean? You can't follow Jesus unto death with best intentions. The best you're going to get with best intentions is brokenness, regret, and remorse. You say, well, what do we do, Travis? It's very simple. Look in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is the same man that we see with best intentions. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says to them, he says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses is, the uh, Greek word is martyrs, meaning you'll be able to sacrifice and to die for me. And it's going to begin in Jerusalem, Judea, and then goes to the end of the earth. But the first thing that you and I receive when we receive the Holy Spirit and are filled with Him is this. The first thing you're going to do is not speak in tongues, church. We don't have to get into a big argument about that. The first thing you're going to do is not speak in tongues. The first thing you're going to get is power. So forget the speaking in tongues. Power. Power with the Holy Spirit. See, there are many Christians today who struggle with sin, who struggle with a stronghold, and they're believers. They have the best intentions. Man, if I could just stop drinking, if I could just stop this, if I could just stop that, but if we receive the Holy Spirit, we get power. We get power. Then you don't look so much like the world. You start to begin to look like the one you follow, Jesus. See, power is the direct effect that is given to us when we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter, a man with best intentions, a man who loves Jesus. How many of you love God? Oh, I love God. I love God. How many of you got ideas and, and these, these things that you want to do for the Lord and that you feel like God, God wants you to do? How many of you got that? All right, me too. Me too. I got it, I got it, I got it. But with those best intentions, if I don't have the, the Holy Spirit and the power to do those things, the best I'm going to get is brokenness. Broken dream, broken intentions. I have to have and receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Case in point, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak any other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now watch this. There was dwelling in Jerusalem people from every nation. And the sound came and... People were saying they were amazed, they were astonished, and they were speaking in everybody's language that was there, and they heard them, and some said that they were drinking early in the morning and getting drunk. Others said, I hear my own language, I understand what they were saying. Look at verse 12. And all were perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said they were filled with new wine. Now watch this. Peter, with best intentions and no Holy Spirit, follows at a distance from Jesus. But in verse 14, look where Peter is. But Peter standing with. There's a big change in position of Peter. Peter standing with the eleven. With the eleven. Lifted up his voice. If you remember before the Holy Spirit, Peter was behind, Peter was below and Peter was broken. Now Peter is with, and now Peter lifts up his voice. The defense that he was not able to give Jesus, he now gives. He lifted up his voice and addressed them, saying, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words, 
For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. This is not the same man. This is not the same man. I'm going to tell you that right now. This is not the same man. This man could not even keep up with Jesus. This man, when the guards start to beat him, didn't do anything. Now he stands up, and this is what he says. This is bold, guys. This is bold. He stands up with the 11, and he looks at the surrounding people, people from every single nation there. They came to worship God, and he says this. Listen to what I'm telling you right now. Listen. And he lifts up his voice to where everybody can hear him. That is a totally different man. A man who does not even defend Jesus now lifts up his voice and tells everybody around him, shut up and pay attention to what I'm about to tell you because it's very important. Listen up. And everybody's just like captivated by this man and what he's doing. Watch what happens. Let's keep reading here for just a second. Look at verse 36. It says this, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That is bold. That is calling some people out. That is calling some people out. So here's a man who actually, in the midst of all this, has forgiven himself and has received restoration from Jesus. Now with filling with the Holy Spirit, he lifts up his voice and he gives a defense to Jesus. He says this, this Jesus who is now the Lord and Christ of the whole world whom you crucified. Now, that's calling for a fight. And there's a lot of people there. Thousands of people there, and he tells them, you crucified him. That's a totally different man. Totally different man. Now watch what he says. He says this, Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? I want you to stop right there. When Jesus was betrayed, Peter, when they first came to him, to get Jesus, Peter, with the best intentions, best intentions, loves Jesus, takes out his sword, and he swings it and lops a dude's ear off. Just lops it off. Now, I don't know if you've ever been hit in the ear, but that would hurt. Every time I read that story, I'm like, hmm. Okay? Now, he, here's what I love about this. Peter's a fisherman. He's not a soldier. Okay, so I'm pretty sure he was aiming to kill the guy, been missed. Best intentions make you look stupid sometimes. Really do, really do. Best intentions make you look stupid. I got this, Jesus. <laughs> Let me take care of this. You know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm left-handed. I should have had it in my left hand. All right. And he lobs the dude's ear off, and Jesus is like, stop. Everybody stop. Picks the dude's ear up and heals it, puts it back on the guy. I, you know, he spit in dirt one time to heal a guy's eyes, so I always like to think that he took the ear and was like, <laughs> put it all back on there. Hey, he could have, you don't know. I'm going to ask him that. It's like, did you lick his ear? And then like, it probably won't be that important once I get to heaven. But anyway, but he spit in dirt one time and made mud and put it over the guy's eye. So what's to say he didn't like, I don't know, spit on the ear and, Put it on there. Anyway, the point of the story is, here's Peter defending Jesus. He cuts the guy's ear off, and he cuts somebody. Now, best intentions without the Holy Spirit are a failure to do what's right. Best intentions without the Holy Spirit are a failure to do what's right. Here is Peter before the Holy Spirit, and he, lost, he cuts the dude's ear off. Peter, after the Holy Spirit, lifts up his voice, and guess what? He gets the cutting right this time. With his words, he cuts him right to the heart. Not bad for a fisherman that's never swung a sword. Swung a sword. Swung a sword. Who's never wielded a sword? There you go. Not bad, huh? 
See, what happens is when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, now the Word of God becomes even more living and powerful so that when you speak it, it would not only cut you to the heart and transform you, but when you say it to other people, it'll hit them. It'll hit them. It'll hit them. Not bad, huh? Not bad for a fisherman. Now watch what happens. He gives this speech. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many words he bore witness. Many words he bore witness. With many words he was with them. He defended Jesus. He glorified Jesus. And with many words, he self-sacrificed his own reputation. And with many words, he was willing to go to the death for Jesus. And with many words, he was there and talking about Jesus and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked, crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Here's a man who can't even keep up with Jesus. Here's a man who's got the best intentions. Here's a man that loves Jesus, but at the very end of it, he denies Jesus three times. But with the power and the feeling of the Holy Spirit, through his message, 3,000 people are saved in one day who now are following Jesus. Wait a minute. This is the same guy who looked at a little servant girl and said, uh, I, don't, I don't know him, I don't know him, and was scared to death of a little servant girl, who now stands up with people from every nation and tells them, you better listen to what I'm about to say, you need to repent because Jesus Christ is Lord. And on that day, he was able to follow Jesus, not only that, but he brought 3,000 people with him. What happened to him is my question. What happened to him? He still got best intentions, but what happened to him is this. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. It makes all the difference. See, in your ministry, everybody's called to ministry. You know, you're called to ministry. You're called to ministry. Yeah, you're called to ministry. Chris, you're called to ministry. Do you know that? You're called to ministry. Yes, you are. Don't shake your head and know it, mate. You're called to ministry. You're called to ministry. Do you know that? You're called. You're called. Don't fall asleep on me. You're called. You're called. You're called. So if I don't sing, I don't get behind a pulpit and preach, I don't care. That's not what ministry is to the fullest extent. You know, you're called. Dorian, you're called. You're called. You're called. You're called, Ms. Gomez. Tim, hey, Mr. Holman, Rosalind, y'all called. Hey, Will, did you know you're called to ministry? Did you know that? If you didn't, you know now. Now you're responsible for what you know. Uh oh. Do you know you're called? You're called to ministry? Mason, you know you're called? Mr. Hicks, you know you're called? Chad, you, yeah, you know you're called. Joanna, yeah? Mr. Foley, you know you're called to ministry? Do you know that? If we call ourselves Christians and we follow the Lord, we are called to ministry. Every single one of you, me included. This is a. a tip of the iceberg. That's all this is. A tip of the iceberg. You are called to ministry wherever you go and whatever you do and whatever you say. The people you work with, your family, whatever it is, you are called to ministry and to show Jesus Christ to somebody else. But you cannot do it with best intentions. You can't do it with best intentions. And look, I know, if you're like me, I got best intentions. I got best intentions. I want to do good. I want to do what's right. But I can't unless I receive the fullness and power of the Holy of Holies, His Spirit. And being raptured with that every single day. Did you know the Holy Spirit is what enables me to put, to put my sin down and to deny my flesh? Did you know that? Because if you can't deny your flesh, you will be hindered in ministry all the days of your life. All the days of your life. Every single day, you're like, I got these best intentions. I want to do this. I want to do that. But I just can't. Well, you need the Holy Spirit. 
Because the first thing that you're going to be able to do with the Holy Spirit is this, move in a new and powerful way. It might be speaking in tongues, but guess what? When you move in the power of the Holy Spirit, what you tried to do your whole life for Jesus, now you're able to do at one time. Just look at Peter. That's why I love Peter so much, because I can relate to him. I can. I can. I know you got good intentions. I know, Peter, you got good intentions. I know you're going to follow me to the death. But look, before this night's over, you're going to deny me three times. And his best intentions got him there. But when the Holy Spirit came, Peter was a totally different dude. Totally different dude. Now, with that heaviness being said, that everybody's called to ministry, and you're like, oh, my goodness. How am I going to pay for seminary? Okay? How will I pay for seminary? Well, look, God might call some of you to seminary, but God might call, God's called all of us to the seminary of the Holy Spirit. And we need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in order for us to minister, to give us boldness to talk to other people about Jesus, to give us strength and power to overcome sin in our life, to give us the power to understand other people, to give us power to witness to other people, to give us power to that when we lay hands on somebody to pray for them, they can be healed, right? Right? There's power in that. And we need to every day be filled with that. Jenny, you sang that song. That song right there was beautiful. Did y'all not think that was, I I loved it, right? And we're going to sing it here in a second. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We're going to sing it here in a second. But what that song was saying was every morning you were saying this. Basically, you were saying this, Holy Spirit, fill me up. This is Travis' translation. Holy Spirit, fill me up. Make your home in me that I might have power to do what I need to do for you. That's what it was. Church, I don't, I'm not so interested about making this a big mega church. I'm more interested in about every single one of you being filled with the Holy Spirit and doing what God's called you to do. Okay? Okay? That's, that's, that is my heart's desire. I know that because I, I tear up every time I think about it. I'm not so much interested about you coming and hearing a great message. I'm more interested about you on a day-to-day basis being so filled with the Holy Spirit that when you go out, when you go out, people literally will see and experience Jesus Christ in your life. Because whether you know it or not, that is what ministry is. That is what ministry is. And when people see that and then you say, well, hey, I, I, you know, I go to Mission City Church, and then they come here, and they will come. Then they get to experience the same thing. That's what I want for every single one of you, to fulfill your God-given destiny. But you can't do it with best intentions. You have to have the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit. We have to receive and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jenny, will you come up here? Come on. I know, I know you hate me putting you on the spot, but that was such a beautiful song. Best intentions without the Holy Spirit will end up in a failure. Will end up in a failure. Now, I think that's what I said. <laughs> I think that's what I said. Might not have been me talking. The best intentions without the Holy Spirit will end up in a failure. I want the Holy Spirit. I need, I don't, I want, I need the Holy Spirit to keep doing what I'm doing. And so do you. To keep doing what you're doing. This is what we're going to do. I want you to stand with me. And we're going to worship.